The Notorious Case of Wayne Jenkins Wayne Jenkins was the ringleader of the Notorious Gun Trace Task Force, which was supposed to rid the city of criminals. This elite unit, tasked with maintaining law and order, strayed into organized crime. Look at me. I'm Sergeant Wayne Jenkins of Gun Trace Task Force. I'm assigned to Baltimore City Police Department. The Gun Trace Task Force evolved into a hub of robbery and drugs. Their crimes included planning armed robberies, planting evidence, and fabricating drug sales. As if that's not enough, Jenkins and his crew's reckless actions led to the death of Albert Davis. The criminal ring ultimately met its downfall when Antoine Washington, a heroin dealer with ties to Jenkins' network, was convicted. Wiretaps during this investigation inadvertently captured the voices of the eight corrupt officers. Their evil activities made headlines and diminished the trust people, especially family members of Albert Davis, had in the police. Do you trust the police department after what your family has been through? No, sir. No, no. Did anything change that? I don't think so, not. An investigation by the FBI revealed the depths of the task force's corruption. Well, how about we just go with the thing? Act like, oh, is everything okay? You get one of the things? Jenkins, the gang leader, had been protecting the drug trade, enabling a multi million dollar operation to thrive. After gathering all the evidence, Jenkins and his cohorts were finally apprehended. Despite the horrifying nature of Jenkins' offenses, his actions during sentencing managed to shock everyone present. During the trial, Jenkins took a plea deal and was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. However, what he said when given the opportunity to speak was even more shocking. No, ma'am, I'm ashamed of myself. The remorse he displayed during his sentencing contrasted starkly with the ruthless behavior he and his crew exhibited. However, while Jenkins' behavior raised eyebrows, this is Christopher McNabb, who is facing charges for the murder of his two-week-old child in Covington, Georgia. After the child's mother reported the baby missing to police, local law enforcement immediately launched a search. Later that night, McNabb is seen in front of TV cameras begging for his child back. I want my kid back, man. That's my child, man. I want my kid, man. The next day, the child's body was found in a nearby wooded area. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, which was later ruled a homicide. Side. McNabb was arrested and charged with the murder of his own two-week-old baby. After he was found guilty, we now move on to the sentencing. McNabb can then be heard claiming his innocence. I'm innocent. I didn't do it. I've maintained that the whole time. I would never do this. That's all I gotta say. I would never do it. I'm innocent. And now the judge lets McNabb unknowingly choose his own sentence. You claim you're innocent, so you tell me what sentence the man or woman that you claim did this should receive. If you ever find out who did them, they deserve to be under the jail. Okay. So they ought to get the maximum sentence. Most definitely. Okay. On the crime of malice murder, I sent you to life in confinement without parole. On the sentence of death of another, I sent you to After McNabb was handed down the max sentence, he was moved to Hayes State Prison in Tryon, Georgia, where he is serving his life sentence. This is Ezra McCandless. Please rise. Ezra J. McCandless was a woman born in 1997 as Monica Kay to a teenage mother, Rosalina Gunnelson, in Stanley, Wisconsin. She remained close to her after her parents' divorce when she was 12 years old. She experimented with different names and pronouns in high school before legally changing her name to Ezra McCandless. She moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin after dropping out of college. In August 2017, McCandless moved in with her boyfriend, Jason Mengel, a 33-year-old National Guard medic. Around the same time, she met Alex Woodworth, a 23-year-old barista and substitute teacher at a coffee shop. Not long after, McCandless had an abortion and started a secret romantic relationship with Woodworth. In February 2018, McCandless accused one of Mengel's friends of sexually assaulting her while she passed out. Woodworth did not support McCandless's account of events, and the case was later dropped. After Mengel found out about McCandless's relationship with Woodworth and the alleged assailant, a public argument occurred at a coffee shop. McCandless blamed Woodworth for ending her relationship with Mengel and asked him not to talk to her again. She continued to talk with Mengel and sent him journals expressing her regret for betraying him. On March 22, 2018, McCandless saw Mengel at a coffee shop and then went to visit Woodworth at his house. Later that day, McCandless knocked on the door of a dairy farmer, Don Sippel, claiming she was a victim of an assault. She was covered in blood and mud and had some bruises. This is Don Sippel calling and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house and somebody attacked her and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn and, and what is the address you're located at? When detectives searched the dairy farm, they found Woodworth's body. He had been stabbed 16 times in the head, neck, groin, and torso. 
McCandless was arrested and later convicted of his murder. She initially claimed she could not remember what had happened. However, the evidence presented during her trial suggested that she had planned the murder and attempted to make it look like self-defense. She was sentenced to life imprisonment and showed no remorse or reaction as her sentence was read. McCandless's obsession led her to ruining her life. 